Theory is History by Javis Banaji. This is Chapter 6, Agrarian History in the Labor Organization of Byzantine Large Estates, 6.1. Introduction. Although the emergence and consolidation of the new provincial aristocracies of late antiquity meant a considerable development of large estates and their exploitation as jointly owned consolidated holdings, not much has been written about the organization of estates. Indeed, till today, the only focused monograph is a study published in 1931. Jean Gascou's thesis showed little interest in the internal administration and labor arrangements of the large estates, and his, base, and his basic argument was in any case hostile to such a perspective, since the estates, for him, were essentially public institutions with the aristocracy working largely within a fiscal regime. Kaplan's recent book systematically avoids Egypt and bases its survey of the earlier centuries, 6th to 7th, on a kind of source material that can tell us little about the actual functioning of estates. This is all the more surprising as the new estates reflect the characteristics of the late empire in a particularly lucid form from the social origins and character of their owners to the managerial options they preferred. And the extraordinary sense of submission they imposed on a labor force, which was after all both free and structured and controlled essentially through contracts. Papyri from Egypt reflect a better image of these processes than any other body of evidence as they stem directly from the operations of rural economy but their dispersed and difficult character is possibly one reason for the neglect of aristocratic economy. However, the most important reason is probably the influence of minimalist views of the ancient economy. The idea that pre-capitalist classes lacked both sophistication and basic economic rationalism, and that large landowners in particular were simply rentiers with no interest in labor processes or the broader organization of production. My interest in this paper is in the status of the peasantry in the late antique world, which very roughly spans the period from the 4th to the 7th centuries. This was an epoch of rapid social change, of new cultural dynamisms, and of a large-scale restructuring of both economic and political life. For generations, however, the vitality and innovation of this period, a post-classical one, were simply ignored. And these prior proto-medieval centuries were seen as an age of unrelieved gloom and decay. When this sweeping orthodoxy was later relaxed, the assumptions scholars had made about the agrarian life of the period were merely inverted, and consequently one is left today with two contradictory models which no longer seem particularly useful. Neither of these models is tenable, as each fails to capture the peculiarity and sophistication of late antique economy and culture, which with their deep-rooted and multiplex hierarchies were nonetheless more fluid and democratic than the world from which they emerged. The parochial and human slaveries of the classical world were superseded by more metaphysical subordinations civility to the emperor and to God, but both assumed freely by subjects conscious of themselves as loyal and or devout individuals. At the economic level, more and more labor power was repulsed from the fabric of the old economy and absorbed in the creative environment of monasteries and large estates. Jordan's work shows that there was a long-term expansion of wage employment and Susan Harvey's study of asceticism emphasizes its profound links with the growing insecurities of a world repeatedly ravaged by warfare and scarcity. These wider or deeper contexts are naturally presupposed here, but they are important for the economy of the late empire is at one level incomprehensible without them. A historiography of abstractions. When a recent study of Egypt in the fourth to early 5th centuries gives historians the option of choosing between the feudalism of the large estates and the unchanging centrality of the small family farm, 
the contrast is badly conceived, for feudal economies of a purer type have always presupposed what one historian calls the primacy of peasant economy. Begnall clearly did not intend agrarian historians to choose between peasant proprietorship and tenancy, for these could easily have coexisted, as they frequently have done, but between statuses. Were peasants free or were they bound to large estates? That they may have been both free and worked for large estates is not an option he considers, for he, like the traditionalists whose conclusions he rejects, automatically identifies large estates with the exercise of coercion. To reject the idea of widespread or universal coercion, he feels he must reject the view that large estates were an important element in the rural economy of the late empire. Thus, Gutzwurtschaft and Grundertschaft are both effectively swept away in one massive sweep of iconoclasm, and the issue of how large estates were actually organized is left in limbo. There has, of course, been a long tradition of defining the peasants working on such estates as serfs, influenced clearly by the general conception of the colonnade as an essentially medieval or feudal type of institution, which coerced an unwilling peasantry into service on the large estates. The assumption here should be that landlords extracted labor by force, but in fact, proponents of this view do not see serfdom in terms of the actual organization of labor but as a more diffuse or abstract juridical relation. The economic forms in which estates exploited these juridical serfs, the so-called coloni, were the usual types of tenancy. As Clausing put it, the colonus is revealed by the codes as a small tenant whose most noticeable characteristic was his legal attachment to the soil. He cultivated his own land, as a payment for the use of the land he owed a yearly rental to the landlord. The rent was ordinarily paid in kind. The legal evidence, however, and the problems of its historical interpretation were too complex to sustain such lucid simplicities, and the thesis of a late Roman serfdom was largely given up. The post-war revisionism was led by Johnson and West in an influential work published in the 1940s. They rejected the view that the peasants who worked on the large estates were serfs of some kind. The law did not bind the tenant to the soil. We suggest that the Inapographoi Georgioi were free tenants, <laughs> since free clearly refers to the lack of any definite legal restrictions on the mobility of the peasantry, one or two qualifications might be useful. The juridical status of the so-called tenants is no indication of how much pressure landlords actually applied to secure the submission or even complete dependence of their workforces, and certainly not proof that they did not apply such pressure. Secondly, they admit, or sorry, they themselves admit that the position of the tenant seems to deteriorate in the sixth century. This was especially true of sharecroppers. Thus, the legal freedom enjoyed by the Byzantine tenantry was no guarantee that their actual economic conditions might not deteriorate and make them more vulnerable to domination by landowners. However, it is worth retaining the idea that the tenants recruited by large landowners were free peasants. For this tends to discredit the notion that they, in particular, depended on either servile or semi-servile labor of the sort that sustained production on the estates of the Russian Pometshiki. Cons one consequence is obvious. Whichever view one adopts of the freedom of lack the of the freedom of lack of freedom of the late antique peasantry, the majority of scholars seem to concur in the belief that large estates or large estate peasants, the peasants of the Appians, for example, were small tenants, and that estates parcelized their land into small holdings, which were then leased out for payments in cash and or kind. With the exception of Mikwitz, I am not aware of a single dissenting view in this matter. This consensus is even more impressive when we consider that both Johnson and West and Jean Gascou took the trouble to note that no leases actually survive in the relatively abundant documentation of the Appian State of the Appian estate. 
It is the aim of this paper to reject this view and substitute a more complex model. I shall argue that the organization of the Byzantine large estate was fundamentally similar to the organization of Egyptian large estates in the late 19th and 20th centuries. To be able to establish this, however, we have to do several things. One, look at the terminology for rural classes without making apparently common sense assumptions as to who the Georgioi were likely to have been. They are normally thought of as peasants, but the issue is who or what was a peasant in the late antique context. Two, re-argue the case for permanent labor. Three, pay more attention to the details of our evidence, referring especially to a few recently published papyri. And four, correlate all this evidence with, what, with whatever one has begun to learn about the organization of estates in the more recent period, relying mainly on the work of Roger Owen and Alan Richards and the sources they have used. 6.3, rural stratification. Um, Giyushunt, Tatoris, and Ergete. Lots of words I can't pronounce. In his recent book, The Pasha's Peasants, Kenneth Kuno had drawn attention to the existence of a highly stratified rural society before 1800. The gap between the small holding and landless strata and the wealthy peasantry increased in the course of the 19th century, but it is clear that it pre-existed the reforms of Muhammad Ali. In general, this stratification may be summed up by referring broadly to the wealthier peasant stratum, smallholders and the landless. Clearly, much of the fiscal proletarianization, which Baer describes as characteristic of the regimes of Sa'id and Ismail, was born overwhelmingly by the middle group, those described as smallholders. Of course, above these various groups were the large landowners, drawn mainly from the ruling family, high officials, army officers, wealthy merchants, and the land companies controlled by foreign and local investors. Now similar divisions characterize the late antique rural situation in Egypt. The Egyptian peasantry of the sixth century was a deeply stratified mass with divisions which broadly correspond to the three tiers mentioned above. The papyri from Aphrodito show that villages were run by a small circle of the leading village families who described themselves as Ketetorus or Sintelesti. Kittitor was Kittitor was the term most often used for small and middling landowners who stood between the aristocracy and the mass of the more humble peasantry, regardless of whether they were urban or village based. The aristocracy purely urban class were geochunts. By contrast with these middling landowners, and better structured and more elaborately graded than their nascent counterparts of the 19th century. What is significant, however, is that the leading village families, a group with all the characteristics of a wealthy peasant stratum, never called themselves Georgioi, and this despite their largely Coptic cultural affinities with the rest of the peasantry, even the more substantial Lysis or Lessies describe themselves as Miss Thoite rather than Georgioi. Indeed, these lessees hired laborers whom they ordinarily referred to as Georgioi. The implication of all this is that the Georgioi were not primarily a landed class, or more accurately, accurately not seen as one, which explains why they were in fact frequently counterposed in imperial legislation, literary sources, etc to the class of landowners as a group defined less by their ownership of land or other resources than by their physical labor on it, whether as smallholders, leases, or rural laborers. Finally, it is possible to find documents where the Georgioi and the Ergete are distinct categories, reflecting situations where smallholders or leases are permanent workers or permanent workers were distinguished from casual laborers. Or gates was the normal term for a casual worker, agricultural or other, but in late antiquity it came to be used of permanent laborers as well.
since the most common way of referring to full-time workers was actually Georgios, it was possible for these terms to acquire broadly similar connotations, as in a novel of Justinian, of Justinian I, which defines, or Ju Justinian I, which defines a particular category of Georgioi, we shall be concerned with as oikators ton chorian keton agron ergate, i.e. rural workers permanently resident on estates. 6.4, the case for permanent labor. The argument for permanent labor flows directly from this. The assertion that hired laborers seem very rarely to have been employed on a permanent basis is not supported by the evidence of the papyri. Indeed, there are at least three levels at which one might respond to this or to the view that permanent labor was not used because it was inefficient. First, there is Egyptian evidence from other periods of the country's agrarian history. Then there is the general evidence of agrarian histori historians, which shows that permanent labor was the structural basis of large estate agriculture in numerous and diverse historical settings until the agrarian restructuring of the late 19th century and the massive casualization of rural labor markets. Two Chinese historians who have dealt with the organization of large estates in late imperial China used the term managerial landlords to describe landowners who based their production on the work of long-term laborers. I shall retain this phrase as an apt description of the Egyptian aristocracy of the 5th to 7th centuries. Finally, there is the evidence, sporadic though it may appear, of the papyri themselves, which ranges from the 3rd to the 7th centuries. I shall concentrate for the moment on levels 1 and 3. In feudalism, in Egypt, Syria, Palestine, and the Lebanon, Poliak describes the peasantry dominated by the Memluk houses of the 18th century as permanent tenants of the Multazims. All the references are to Al-Jabardi's chronicles. However, the term which he seems to translate in this way, Musa Rian, simply has the most general meaning of peasants or farmers, and Al-Jabardi frequently refers to their peasants when he describes the domination of the Multazims, that peasants in the Iltazim system were permanent tenants Thus seems to be a description not of the way the labor process was organized, but of their juridical or quasi-juridical status, and it is therefore worth ignoring this passage. Langrid is, in fact, much more informative about the way the Multazims organized production on their Usia or Us yeah, Usia lands, and mentions leases to the village, sheikhs, paid labor and forced labor as the chief methods used to exploit such land. It is unlikely that these were sharply contrasting systems of production, for each of these methods must have involved some degree of coercion. The fact is that exploitation by the Multazims, whether on their own land or on peasant land, created a general impression that the Egyptian peasantry of the neo mamluk period was a highly vul vulnerable and destitute group. For instance, when Volney wrote that the peasants are hired laborers to whom no more is left than barely suffices to sustain life, he surely could not have meant that paid labor in some formal sense was the regular form in which peasant labor was exploited, but only that whatever the particular form of exploitation, the peasants were as good as laborers. More specific evidence is found again in Gerard who investigated the costs of production in rice growing in the province of Demiera. Gerard refers to les ouvriers attachés pendant l'année aux travaux de l'exploitation and, and distinguishes them from les journaliers, who were clearly casual laborers employed in weeding, transplanting, and cleaning of canals. In short, there is certainly some evidence for the use of permanent paid labor in the period before the full development of the ESBA system, though its actual extent and precise forms remain unknown.
Perhaps the most valuable contribution of the late Ottoman sources is simply the general impression they convey of peasants who could be treated and seen by others as laborers, that is, of a peasantry without the resources, legal or material, to withstand coercion into coerced wage or serf labor. The sharecroppers mentioned by Polyak, again on the basis of al Jabardi, would undoubtedly have belonged to this category, being mostly laborers paid in kind. Again, the ancient evidence is largely concordant with this. As I noted earlier, Egyptian and other ancient sources tend not to treat the Georgoi as a landed class, but as a class living by its labor on the land. On the other hand, the question of permanent labor concerns the more specific issue of whether and how frequently such peasants worked as full-time rural laborers on large estates with the resources in land, grain, and cash to employ them on this basis. Rathbone's study of the Fayum estate of Appianus shows that at least some third century large estates used the system of permanent labor, though his work also suggests that in terms of actual labor inputs, such estates remained massively dependent on the supply of casual workers. Um, I lost my spot. How did that happen? Mexican wheat estates of the late 19th century tend to confirm this pattern, showing that estates with resident workforces consistently required large numbers of seasonal laborers. Mertens characterizes such haciendas as wage labor enterprises, and in a strict sense, the same description might be used of the Apianus estate. The significant point here is that the formation of an aristocracy did not preclude and may even have stimulated patterns of labor use, dependent largely on wage labor. The next piece of evidence is also from the third century. This time, from the estates of Calpurnia, Her Heraclea, who came from an extremely wealthy Alexandrian family. In P. Oxy XL II, I don't know what that Roman numeral would be, 3048, dated uh, March 17th to 18th, 246, we have an absolutely unique snapshot of the labor force of a large aristocratic estate in the mid third century. Five groups are listed, two at managerial and three at workforce level. Of the non-managerial categories, it is clear that the mainstay of her estates were the Georgioi. They, however, were not tenants in the ordinary sense, as the document specifically tells us that the Georgioi, like other sections of the labor force, received monthly salaries in grain. Moving into the fourth century, we have one document, the quarterly accounts of a fairly large estate at Hermonthus for one quarter in the year 338. Here, the, disturb the disbursements listed in Col XV show that wheat ra rations of two artabas per month were paid to a group of workers called ergate. They were probably permanent laborers, as 20 are named individually for the month of Farmuthi, and the payments must have been at least partly designed to sustain the family's consumption. The more specialized workers on this estate were called Opsoniaste, Opsonia, being regular wage payments in cash or kind. From the 5th century, possibly, a short account from the Hermopolite Nomi carries a heading which may be translated as account of the wheat dispersed as wages of our Georgioi for the 12th indiction. These laborers were certainly permanent as their wages are said to be for the whole year, although the amounts vary. Finally, a much later account from the archive of Papas, Pagark of Edfu, dispersed 132 artabas of barley, hyper misthu gorgon. Divided by a standard ration of 12 artabas, this would yield a full-time labor force of 11 workers. Um... The least this establishes is that rural wage laborers were used in Egypt, not just on a casual or seasonal basis, but as permanent or resident workforces. The next issue is whether we can determine a form of exploitation, a labor system, 
characteristic of the deployment of these workers. Certainly the most fascinating section of the Appianus labor force are the Epoikite. They are described by Rathbone as tenant laborers or tenants with labor dues. And their crucial function seems to have been the supply of peak season labor at lower wage rates for a payment determined partly in cash and partly in the form of accommodation on the estate. Whereas casual workers were paid four drachmas a day for harvest work, these laborers received the substantially lower wage of a two drachmas six obols. In the growing literature on labor tenancy, the usual term for such workers is labor tenants. Another large third century um, estate that made systematic use of labor tenancy was the Usia of Val Valerius Titanianus at the Adelphia in the Fayum. This was a large wine producing operation owned by a former high official who was part of the Alexandrian aristocracy. Accounts for the year 239 show that his estate extracted part of its labor supply by charging a rent for accommodation on the estate and the settlements called Epoikia and computing part of the rent in labor days. Since the basis or since the basic rent included 12 days of labor every half year, the estate obviously used the system to secure a substantial quantity of free casual labor from its tenants. However, at the imputed wage of two drachmas, there was no difference in the rates paid to these workers and to ordinary day laborers. These two examples show that large landowners were consciously structuring their supplies of labor in forms that gave them maximum flexibility and that forms of labor tenancy were certainly in use by the third century. 6.5 Restructuring in the Later Empire It is doubtful if the Alexandrian aristocracy of the 3rd century ever completely succeeded in forming a coherent and stable class. Their purely economic influence was, in any case, limited, as much of the land was controlled by the municipal landed families who ran the town councils in the different districts or gnomes of Egypt. In this largely municipal milieu, only the bigger landowners could have replicated the forms of management characteristic of the Alexandrian families. The majority undoubtedly relied on leasing as the dominant method of management, recruiting leasees from the considerable mass of landless or near landless peasants for whom tenancy was a regular form of employment. In fact, it was this stratum of municipal landowners or landholders which would eventually suffer a near eclipse as their properties were relentlessly sundered in the process of subdivision and the deeper dynamisms of the late empire. Economic, social, political unleashed a prolonged restructuring of agrarian society with the emergence of new landowning groups such as the nascent aristocratic families of the fifth century, the church, the monasteries, and the middling bureaucracy of the provincial towns. Above these groups were the massive possessions of the imperial household, including the estates of various members of the imperial family, organized in the Domus Divina and below them in the villages. A rich peasantry who are remarkable counterparts of the village, sheikhs of the 19th century. Thus, the agrarian landscape was both stratified and complex, and of course, there's no reason to suppose that the forms of agrarian management characteristic of the elite aristocracy were found at most other levels, other than the Domus Divina itself, emerging from the upper ranks of the services as Obstrogorsky, in fact, wrote of the Byzantine aristocracy of a later period. The new landed aristocracy comprised mostly high officials who, like the Russian Pomeshiki of the later 18th century, were great believers in the careful management and bureaucratic administration of their properties, influenced no doubt by their imperial background. These then were directly managed properties with owners investing heavily in the infrastructure of administration.
By contrast, leasing was widespread on most other types of properties, though by itself the term conceals a great variety of content, both as to the type and duration of the lease and the type of leasee. In the countryside around Hermopolis, much of the land was leased to George Oy, who resided in the town itself. The, least, the lessers were affluent middle-class landowners, many of them women or ecclesiastical holders, such as the Holy Church of the Resurrection, whose lands were situated to the east of the town and leased out in tiny parcels, one to two auroras for durations of two years. In the village of Aphrodito, further south, middle-class landholders dealt with a similar stratum of peasants, though we also have leases of substantial farms or gardens to a group of obviously wealthier leases. Church and monastic properties were often exploited on perpetual leases, and the holders of these were again likely to be substantial leases or persons of the aristocracy. Finally, some large estates were leased out to commercial farmers, who were probably similar to the Italian Masari of more recent times. It should be clear then that the argument which follows is not intended to characterize the agrarian economy as a whole, but only the organization of aristocratic estates administered in the complex and bureaucratic forms characteristic of the 6th and 7th centuries. Nor should the contrast between actoristic of the 6th and 7th centuries. Oh, sorry. What? No, sorry. <laughs> Nor should the contrast between direct management and leasing be exaggerated, both because the more humble leases were often simply laborers and the lease more like a labor contract. This was especially true of sharecroppers and because tenancy could be integrated into a regime of direct management, as I shall now try to show. Lost my spot. Oh, as I shall now try to show. The new estates, or sorry, 6.6, .6, the new estates. In his monograph, The Large Estates of Byzantine Egypt, Hardy says almost nothing about leasing. Although curiously, his account of the Appian estate assumes that it was organized on the basis of rents extracted from a, a peasantry, which while bound to the soil, nonetheless leased its lands from the proprietors. In a similar vein, the Italian scholars, or the Italian scholar Segre could write, the conditions under which the colonai rented the estates from the managers are rather obscure. Tenancy at will is frequent in the, in the leases of the 5th and 6th centuries. Apparently the colonai ad scriptici remained on the estates for generations and cultivated the soil under rather permanent conditions. To add to the confusion, Segre then went on to draw an analogy with Mexican estates and describe the colonnade in more general terms as a form of organization of agricultural labor. The sheer incongruousness of these accounts should have warned later scholars that something was seriously wrong and that it might be worth probing the organization of estates with fewer preconceptions. It is worth noting, however, that the first editors of the Oxrincus Papyri thought that the George Way working on large 6th six, century estates were laborers of some sort, for laborers was how they usually translated George Way. The oxyrinkite material relates predominantly to large and very large estates. Unfortunately, it is easier to form some impression of how the aristocracy uh, was structured in what was then a fairly dynamic part of Middle Egypt capital of the pro province of Arcadia than to know how the different layers organized estates which clearly differed greatly in size. The overwhelming bulk of the evidence derives from a single estate, that of the Appian family, though of course important isolated documents survive from other aristocratic, ecclesiastical, and medium-sized properties. <laughs>
By contrast, the FAM material is much more dispersed and the evidence less easy to construct or to reconstruct. The new aristocratic estates which emerged in the main part of the 5th century to reach their classical form in the 6th were called oikoi, houses, to emphasize their structured and permanent character. From the Appian archive, it is certain that these estates were held in joint ownership and thus immune to the devastating fragmentation of partible inheritance. At the economic level, the most important fact about them is their considerable integration into monetary economy and their ability to generate substantial revenues in gold. Finally, irrigation was widespread on the new estates and hired labor was used extensively. The rapid diffusion of water wheels in the countryside of the later 5th and 6th centuries reflects the willingness of owners to make substantial investments and the spread of summer irrigation and implies a larger Byzantine legacy in the agricultural revolution of the Islamic period than Watson seems to allow for. In particular, the stimulus of an expanding wine industry encouraged producers to structure these investments carefully. For example, in the Appian archive, the average turnover of an axle was put at seven years in the issue of spares administered from a central office in, in Oxyrhynchus. The implicit rationalism of the new estates would no doubt have extended to their deployment of labor. The Appian Archive contains a series of accounts listing receipts in cash and kind, and at first sight this type of accounting seems like strong evidence in favor of the theory that estates based their revenues on the leasing of land to small tenants. But a closer scrutiny of the accounts suggests that, insofar as the estate drew revenues from rent payments, the bulk of these revenues derived from the payments of substantial looking tenants who bear a certain resemblance to the better off arrendatarios on Mexican haciendas of the early 19th century. Moreover, the analogy of these haciendas shows that estates which drew part of their income from cash rents, for example, might still be predominantly, predominantly based on the exploitation of permanent laborers. The crucial fact about the Appian holdings is that the basic constituents of the estate were not villages, but the smaller settlements known as Epoikia. Since these are a decisive clue to the organization of labor, they seem like an obvious starting point for the argument. The Epoikia were privately owned settlements, unlike villages, and were mostly controlled by the largest landowners, including the estates of the Domus Divina, the regime of direct management was structured around the Epoikia, and consequently, they had a largely industrial character, in the sense that their sole function was the concentration of groups of workers in residential sites, in close proximity to the fields where they actually worked. Now, this has been a universal feature of large estates of a certain kind, and one imagines that accommodation on these estates would have had a certain, certain similarity to the... Um, Bohios in the larger geometrically structured sugar plantations of Cuba, or the Galpones, barracks or dormitories of the north coast plantations in Peru, or the Calpinarias on Mexican haciendas, where resident workers were housed in shacks. Of course, at another level, the more obvious analogy is with Egypt itself in the 19th and 20th centuries, and I shall deal with this below. The unit of accommodation was the Kellyan room, and in one Appian account, the implication seems to be that some settlements were built to a standard model of 100 rooms. Peasants residing in such settlements were described in the oxy rinkite anyway, as registered employees of the estate, meaning that the estate paid their taxes. The Epoikia contained arable, orchards, and vineyards, and there are repeated references to mechani watering various types of fields. They were heavily supervised and the bulk of the peasants residing in them seem to have been partly or even very largely dependent on wage employment, that is to have been mostly landless workers, though some families could afford to rent substantial holdings. To historians familiar with the agrarian history of the 19th century, these privately owned settlements bear an obvious resemblance to the Esbas, 
so striking indeed that the homology is worth pursuing in more detail. This, I want to argue, lies in a set of labor arrangements which gave owners both flexibility and control. One of the earliest references is from the 1870s by McCohen, who was editor of the Levant Herald and wrote of the estates of the large owners, the wealthier pashas and bays, that they either employed moribane laborers who were paid a share of the crop, usually a fourth, or were worked by subletting small plots of ground at a fixed rental of so many days, field labor, per fedden. In other words, the evolution of the new private estates um, of the new private estates had already generalized a kind of labor tenancy, with owners using the labor of tenants as laborers rather than tenants. In 1898, Nur ed Din described the system a bit more fully, explaining that owners attracted labor by offering workers substantially reduced rents, whose actual payment was then adjusted against any wages they earned. The important point being that the tenant was entirely at the owner's disposal as a wage laborer. Nur ed Din also described another group of workers who were generally paid a one-fifth share of most crops as wages and often depended on consumption loans. In 1901, Nahas published a slightly more detailed account of these arrangements in a chapter of his thesis and was the first to emphasize a crucial feature of the system namely that in hiring workers on this basis, landowners had access to the labor of women and children as well. Contracts were verbal, labor intensely supervised, and the volume of labor adjusted to the requirements of the estate. Nahas noted that in assigning subsistence plots, landowners took account of the size of the tenant household and that the latter in turn contracted to finish or to furnish a specific number of workers as potential wage laborers, with the usual adjustment of wages against rent. Nahas described these groups as workers permanently attached to the estate by contrast with the less privileged and more miserable migrant laborers who were drawn who were drawn chiefly from Upper Egypt. It was also his impression that labor exploited on this basis was less costly than the alternative system of paying workers and a share of the crop despite the considerable enforcement costs of what he called veritable brigades of supervisors. This, of course, is contrary to the thinking of most economists on this issue. To sum up, the details of these arrangements would have varied from one estate to the next, but in essentials, large landowners recruited workers by paying them either in a share of the crop or under some type of labor tenancy. In either case, the fala was simply a wage laborer. 6.7, the labor organization of 6th century estates. To return to the Byzantine evidence, the model offered by the Esbas can and does help to elucidate the corresponding organization of labor. On the 6th century, oh sorry, on the 6th century estates. Two recently published papyri are of special interest here though I shall start by recalling the general characteristics of the labor force on large properties in late antiquity. As I noted earlier, our only explicit definition of the kind of peasants who were called in Napographoi, Georgioi, treats this kind of labor force as resident on estates and as mere laborers. Moreover, this novel and a great deal of other legislation was concerned specifically with problems arising out of claims over the progeny of such resident laborers thus implying that it was not uncommon for workers to reside on estates from one generation to the next, as, for example, on the 19th century Mexican haciendas studied by, Bez by Bezant. In fact, this is shown by two documents of the Appian Archive, with the Georgioi stating in both that they had served the Appians or resided in their Ketima, that is, the Epoikion, Ek Peteron Ke Progonon, from the time of our fathers and our ancestors. Thus, the labor on these estates was, to a large extent, resident. Secondly, it was also intensively supervised. In P. Oxy 2239-598, the aristocrat Flavius John recruited, recruited in Epicaminos, 
or field boss to take charge of general supervision of his Georgeway. The new manager, Jeremias, undertook to, um, to employ every care, every care and efficiency in the cultivation of your estate with regard alike to the new plantation and to the large estate plants. Furthermore, I acknowledge also that I will cause all the laborers of your honor in every place and every holding of the same estate to sow the irrigated fields of the estate, to plant acacias, and to be ready to show every zeal in bringing your landed estates into better condition. Finally, it is clear that some or even many of the Georgioi attached to large estates had livestock of their own. And I suggest that this may have been the main factor which compelled them into forms of labor tendency. As with the Kikuyu squatters employed by white settlers on plantations and estates in the Rift Valley province of the White Highlands in Kenya. What then if the actual deployment of these workers? Estate labor forces included many groups of specialist workers, maintenance staff, such as the carpenters who kept the mechani in repair or actually fabricated them using acacia wood supplied or bought from the estate, millstone cutters, smiths, stonemasons, etc. But few contracts are preserved and it is likely that their employment was not characterized by a standard type of contract. These workers reflected the workings of a free labor market with agreements signed for specific jobs or lifetime contracts, such as one with the aforementioned millstone cutter, who even got the estate to agree that it would pay a substantial fine if his employment was unreasonably terminated. However, the remarks which follow do not apply to these workers, obviously, but to the main groups of the labor force, such as Georgioi, Ampelurgoi, and Pomiride. The system emerges especially clearly in P. Oxy 1, 192 and 206. At one level, in P. Wash University, or P. Wash University 2, 102. At another. In their descripta form in volume 1 of the Oxyrhynchus Papyri, P. Oxy 192, 194, and 206 were all described as loans, and in the first two of these documents, the loans were said to be for a mechane, whatever that might mean. It is now clear, however, that the term actually used in P. Oxy 192 and P. Oxy 206, and almost certainly also in 194, which has still not been fully transcribed, is prokrya, which more precisely is an advance of wages. Thus, all three contracts deal with wage advances paid, as it happens, in Solidi. Secondly, in both P. Oxy 192 and P. Oxy 206, the recipients of these cash advances are Georgioi, and closer attention to the way they are described can allow us to make these documents a key to the interpretation of the labor system on the whole estate. For in P. Oxy 192, the worker Aurelius Apatian is called Anapro in Napographos Georgios, the term used for the vast majority of Georgioi residents resident in the Epoikia, and was himself from the Epoikion of Kenias. In his receipt, the advance is associated with his responsibilities for an irrigated farm called Western. In Pioxi 1 206, some seven decades earlier, the worker John from the Epoikion of Leon is described as Georgios of the Mekane called Small Peso and of the Mekane of Path. <clears throat> this is tedious. The expression Georgios Mekanes is crucial, as we have at least two other documents among the longest in the Apian archive with the same or a similar expression. The first of these, Pioxi, and 2244 repeatedly describes laborers from the various epoikia by the term Georgios Mekenes, meaning the worker assigned to such and such irrigated farm and even refers to John Son, John Son of Peleus from the Epoikian of Leon, 
the worker in Pioxy, 206, that was signed to a different mechane, while Pioxy, 2197, dealing with the consumption of bricks on the estate, refers repeatedly to the farms themselves as under or in the care of such and such Georgios, meaning the plot assigned to this or that individual. Thus, Pioxy, 1206, can be generalized to a large section of the Appian labor force. Through these more detailed documents in the system of work allocation, they imply. The strong implication is that Georgioi or other agricultural laborers, such as those tending gardens or vineyards, were assigned to individual irrigated plots or farms, or gardens or vineyards, or vice versa, usually paid cash wages in the prevalent gold currency and entitled to advances out of them. That these advances were in fact wage payments is especially clear from a her Hermopolite document dated 627, where the concluding formula is the standard clause promising to pay back the advance should the employee abandon or cut short his or her assignment. It is likely, though we cannot prove it, that advances of the sort found in Pioxy 1192 were recorded in accounts pertaining to individual laborers on the pattern described in Rathbone for the Appianus estate. Three of the main water wheel receipts in the Appian archive refer to the Pitakia of individual employees, and these, I suggest, were employees' individual accounts with the estate. The wider analogy here is with the systems of wage accounting which characterized the Mexican haciendas till well into the 20th centuries, a general term for which might be adjust de suentes or account adjustments. At another level entirely, P. Washington University 2, 102, shows individual settlements supplying an agreed number of workers for sewing operations in the auto orgia of the Apian estate. It is possible that in this document, the term ergates simply meant casual laborer, and that the casual labor supply was normally organized through the epoikia, which acted as labor, pro as labor brokers. It is equally possible, however, that the reference was to services required from permanent laborers, and that it did not particularly matter which families or individual family members were finally sent out into the fields. The fact that workers living in these settlements were normally paid wages in cash and or kind makes it more attractive to conceptualize this exaction of labor on the ESBA model as an exchange of labor against wages and not simply as forced labor. Much of this is speculation, of course, and apart from straining at the limits of our knowledge, documents like P. Washington University 2102 emphasize the important methodological point that in ancient history above all, the interpretation of individual items of evidence depends crucially on our building a larger and workable model of how estates actually functioned and of the kinds of labor regimes and systems they evolved. 6.8 Conclusion In L'Habitat Rural en Egypte, Lozac and Hug describe a complex defined a complex defined by cash crops irrigation, the formation of large properties, and the concentration of workers in dispersed settlements controlled by these states. For them, this landscape was a product of the evolving agrarian capitalism of the late 19th century, with its formation of large privately held estates and the spread of perennial irrigation. I have suggested, however, that this pattern was at least partially repl replicated in the history of the 6th century estates. It is, of course, likely that the reordering of labor relations or relationships in the Egyptian countryside of the 19th century with large landowners orchestrating campaigns against the corvée and the esbas, materializing new methods of labor control reflected the spread of summer irrigation and a new set of labor requirements on a state subject to the rationalizing imperatives of 19th century capitalism. Nonetheless, in a longer perspective, these changes appear less revolutionary than they might otherwise seem. For example, in colonizing Egypt, Timothy Mitchell had argued that the ESBA's regime of spatial confinement, discipline, and supervision was emblematic of the much larger emergence of new mechanisms of power, a new principle of order, through which a quintessentially modern state and its colonial agencies pursued the systematic dissolution and synthetic retotalization of societies and communities unstructured by the geometries of capital. All of these are valuable and even obvious perspectives on the changes in the 19th century, which reintegrated Egypt into a more modern world economy shaped by the evolution of British industrial capital.
but at a deeper level, they contain a major problem, or at least a paradox. If the ESBAs were in some sense the revival or reenactment of social forms, methods of organization characteristic of Egyptian large estates in earlier centuries, and above all, in the period marked by the greatest development of private land ownership prior to the 19th century, namely the 5th to 7th centuries, then surely we must, again in some sense, extend these characterizations to the rural society of the 6th, 6th century, and see in the largest states of that period a curious prefiguration of something intrinsically modern. Agriculture was history's first theater of capitalism, but because our notions of the latter have been irreducibly shaped by modern large-scale industry and the profound analysis that Marx developed in capital, we only seem to be able to grasp the history of agrarian capitalism through a sort of palimpsest. The whole debate between the primitivists and the modernists is essentially a misunderstanding caused by this fact. For what the primitivists clearly do is measure economic behavior by the revised edition of capitalism, so to speak. Secondly, it is also worth emphasizing that the Egyptian peasantry in particular has a strangely elusive quality. Our only detailed study in English of the agrarian structure of a country in the Middle East draws a useful distinction between peasant proprietors, crop-sharing peasants, and landless laborers. Even more interestingly, Lambton also pointed out the vast majority of the peasant population of Persia is composed not of peasant proprietors who are a small minority, but of crop-sharing peasants or tenants and landless laborers, and noted that the sharecroppers too, strictly speaking, are landless. Ancient historians who have dealt with Egypt have been ready to assume that the situation Lambton seemed to see as characteristic of the Persian countryside, at least in the recent period, could not have been true of Egypt in antiquity, and that a large and stable class of peasant proprietors existed, which was not drastically undermined even by the renewed expansion of large estates in late antiquity. However, this assumption has little basis in the, ev in the evidence and seems to rest on what might, in what one might call terminological impressionism. I have suggested in this paper that the Egyptian peasantry was a less stable group than this convention assumes, that there was more landlessness in the ancient countryside than we seem willing to allow for, and finally, that the organization of the largest states could well have reflected this fact.